Welcome back to this final part of the video in which we are discussing headaches. Okay, so in this final part, we're going to discuss one final cause uh, of a type of secondary headache. And this final cause that we're going to go over is something called acute angle closure glaucoma, which is one of the two major forms of glaucoma. So the way we're going to do this is we're going to start by going over the basics of what glaucoma is. We'll then discuss the two major different forms of glaucoma, which are primary open angle glaucoma and acute angle closure glaucoma. We'll then discuss the type of headache that acute angle closure glaucoma can give you, and that's the one we're particularly interested in, because primary open angle glaucoma, that doesn't generally give you uh, a headache. That's a much slower process, as we'll see. Uh, so we'll discuss the type of headache that acute angle closure glaucoma can give you, and then we'll end the video by discussing the treatment, and we'll go over both the treatment for primary open angle glaucoma and acute angle closure glaucoma just for completion. Okay, so the basics of glaucoma then. So what do we mean when we say glaucoma? What does it actually mean? Well, glaucoma means too high pressure inside the eye. And you can have this on either one side or both sides. So you can have either unilateral glaucoma in which it's affecting only one eye, and you can have bilateral glaucoma in which it's affecting uh, both eyes. So glaucoma is the name for too high intraocular pressure, which is the name we give for uh, the pressure inside the eye. And we use this abbreviation here, IOP, for intraocular pressure. And I'll just write that down in full here. So IOP stands for intra, that's the I, and then ocular, that's the O, and then of course the P stands for pressure. So glaucoma is effectively the name for intraocular hypertension. So this is in effect, the equivalence of intracranial hypertension, but now occurring inside the eyeball uh, rather than just inside the skull. Okay, so again, I'll stress that you can have glaucoma on one side or you can have it affecting both sides, uh, unilateral glaucoma versus bilateral glaucoma. So it is just a bizarre name for intraocular hypertension, too high intraocular pressure inside one of the eyes or both of them if it's bilateral. So the next question is, how do you end up with too high pressure inside the eye? Well, usually the cause of too high intraocular pressure is that you have too much of a certain fluid that is inside the eye, known as aqueous humor. So raised intraocular pressure is usually due to there being too much aqueous humor. So drawing a little backwards flow diagram here, usually you start off by getting too much aqueous humor and this is going to lead to the rise in intraocular pressure that is then called intraocular hypertension, but the name that we use for that is glaucoma rather than intraocular hypertension. So, what is the aqueous humour? Let's just revise a little bit of eye anatomy. What is the aqueous humour? The aqueous humour is the fluid in the anterior and posterior chambers of the eye. It's produced by the ciliary epithelium and it's going to be absorbed into something called the canal of Schlem. And we need to be aware of all of this, so I'm now just going to uh, draw a picture to remind you of these uh, structures. So what picture am I, about, am I about to draw then? So. I am now going to draw a transverse cross-section through one of the eyes. So you can imagine taking one of the eyes, and let's say, just to have an example, let's take the right-hand eye. So we're going to take the right-hand eye, and we're going to take a transverse cross-section through it. So you can imagine chopping through it in a transverse plane, and then opening up to see the structures. That's what I'm going to draw a picture of. And we're going to draw a picture viewed from above. And the way I'm going to orient it is we're going to be looking at our bottom bit. You know, we've cut it in half and we're now looking at the bottom bit. And I'm going to put the front of this bit at the top. I'm going to put the medial side of it here, the lateral side of it to the right, and the back at the bottom here. And I'm going to draw it a little bit bigger than that. So 
When I'm drawing cross sections of the eye, transverse cross sections of the eye, I always think it's best to start by drawing the iris and the choroid rather than starting by drawing the cornea and the sclera. The picture just ends up looking better usually if I start by drawing uh, the middle bits. And that's the way I'm going to do it. Uh, so it might seem a little bit illogical the way I'm doing it, but there is a reason for it. So this is representing the iris here. And remember, we've taken a transverse cross-section, so we're not going to see really much of the iris. Really, to see the iris, you need to be looking at it. Of course, that's the bit that you can see, the coloured bit, but we're now just seeing its cut surface effectively. So the iris is continuous backwards with the choroid, which is going to come down like this, and then it will end, or at least it will have a hole in it at the point where the optic disc is. And of course, at this position, you're going to have the ciliary muscle coming like so. Okay, and now let's complete up the other side. And by the way, I'm assuming that we have taken a very special transverse cross section here. I'm going to assume that we have taken it at exactly the level where the optic nerve comes out so that we can see the optic nerve. Indeed, this is going to be where the optic nerve is, uh, which is why I have not drawn the choroid going all the way around. Okay, so on the other side here, of course, we're just drawing the symmetrical image. There's the ciliaris muscle. And then the choroid is going to come around like this. Okay, all the way around like so. Okay, so let's just label up some structures here, some very important structures. So at the top there, we've got the iris. Then we have the ciliaris muscle or the ciliary muscle. So ciliaris is there. And then behind that, all of this bit is what we call the choroid. So this is choroid and this is choroid. And I've been referring to this previously when we've been discussing nerves that have gone into the eye. So next, let's now put on the layer that you might have been expecting me to draw first, but I've justified why I didn't draw that first. So let's put on the sclera and the cornea. So um, here, we'll start back here. Here is the sclera, and I'm just drawing it now around the choroid. And then at the front, we're going to have the cornea coming over like this, and I'll just draw its underside here and making a cavity like so. And then the sclera is also going to, of course, cover this side like so. And then again, of course, this is where uh, the optic nerve is going to come through because we have taken this cross section at a very nice level so that we can see uh, the optic nerve. So at the front here, this is the cornea. And then towards the back, it's the sclera. And it looks a little bit strange, so I'm just going to colour it in to try and make it look a little bit better. So all of this is sclera, all of this bit that I'm now colouring in. I'm not sure that the colouring in is actually making it look any better. Uh, but at least you're getting the message that that entire layer there, that is all sclera. And then it's the cornea at the front. The cornea looks fine. I'm not going to colour that in. OK. So, more things to put on. Of course, we need the optic nerve. What colour should I do the optic nerve in? I think I'll do it in white here. So here comes the optic nerve, and the optic nerve, of course, will be covered by the meningeal sheaths, but I'm not going to put those on. Remember, the optic nerve has that canal running through the middle, which I'm trying to show there. And that's the canal through which the central retinal artery, which supplies the retina with blood, and also the central retinal vein, which drains the retina of blood, uh, will run through. Okay, and then the, re the optic nerve is going to be continuous then with the retina, because of course the optic nerve is just made up of the axons of the ganglion cells that are part of the retina, that have their cell body within the retina. So in white here, this is all representing retina. Okay, so that is representing retina. And then back here we have cranial nerve number two, the right cranial nerve number two, of course. And I apologise for how bad my handwriting of retina is there, that's awful. OK, but never mind. So, more things that we need to put on here, of course. There is something very important suspended in the middle of the ciliaris muscle, which is, of course, the lens. So let's put on the lens. So what colour should I pick for the lens? I'll pick some ridiculous colour. I'll go for green. Uh, so here is the lens dangled in between the ciliaris muscle. And again, this isn't a great way to view the lens because remember, we're just taking a cut section through it. Of course, remember, it's round, but we're not seeing the aspect. We're not looking at it from the right direction to see it round. You'd have to be standing here and looking at it uh, from the front to see its proper shape. Uh, but we're just seeing a cross section of it here. Uh, and of course, the lens is suspended 
from the ciliaris muscle by the suspensory ligaments. So let's just add some more uh, annotations on there. So that's the lens, and then we also have the suspensory ligaments. Okay, so these are all the basic structures of the eyeball then, which we would see if we took a cross-section through uh, like this. Now, more terminology then, or more structures. So, this membrane here that lines the ciliary muscle and faces into this chamber here, that's called the ciliary epithelium, and that's going to be responsible for producing the aqueous humor. So let me write this down. So that is the ciliary epithelium. So we're getting close to understanding the aqueous humor now. So ciliary epithelium lines the ciliaris muscle and faces into this chamber. Some terminology with regards to the chambers of the eye. This chamber in front of the iris here, behind the cornea and in front of the pupil, of course, I didn't actually label that on, but I assume you realise that's the pupil there. Um, this chamber here is called the anterior chamber of the eye. So I'll go back to my yellow colour. So this chamber here, this is called the anterior chamber of the eye. Now, what chamber would you think would be the posterior chamber? Well, I think most people, if they were asked what chamber um, they thought would be the posterior chamber, would go for this chamber. No, it is not the posterior chamber. This chamber is the posterior chamber. The chamber behind the iris, but in front of the ciliaris and lens, uh, that is called the posterior chamber. So this chamber here, that is called the posterior chamber. So do not get confused there and think that the posterior chamber is the one actually at the back here. Um, this chamber at the back behind the lens, uh, this is called the vitreous chamber. So this one here, this is called the vitreous chamber. Now, uh, the anterior and posterior chambers are obviously continuous with one another. They have a link between them. The pupil is a link between the anterior chamber and the posterior chamber. So the anterior chamber and the posterior chamber actually both contain the same fluid. And the fluid that they contain is called aqueous humor. And the aqueous humor is going to be continuously produced by the ciliary epithelium. So this epithelium here is continuously producing uh, aqueous humor that's in the posterior and anterior chambers. The vitreous chamber is filled with something called the vitreous humour, this word here, and then this, vitreous humour. And the vitreous humour is much more viscous than the aqueous humour. The aqueous humour is like a syrupy fluid, okay? So it's quite viscous, but it's not a jelly, it still is a fluid. Whereas the vitreous humour, it's a great big blob of jelly-like substance. If you've ever done dissection of the eye, you'll know what I'm talking about. Uh, it comes out as one great big lump, so it's much more viscous uh, than the aqueous humour. It's, you know, between being a liquid and a solid, really. Uh, whereas the aqueous humour is indeed a liquid, it's just a very viscous liquid. Okay, right. So, um, anterior chamber, posterior chamber, vitreous chamber, anterior and posterior chambers full of aqueous humor, vitreous chamber full of vitreous humor. I don't care about the vitreous humor. We're going to be discussing the aqueous humor. So, aqueous humor is produced by the ciliary epithelium. If it's continuously being produced, then it must also be being resorbed somewhere, and indeed it is resorbed, and it's resorbed into a structure called the canal of Schlem. Uh, so let me put this here. So the aqueous humor is going to be resorbed into something called the canal of Schlem. Now, where is the canal of Schlem? The canal of Schlem is right at the rim of the cornea in this position here. So I'll just put this on as a blob, a pink blob here. So it's in this sort of position like so. And it goes all the way around the junction between the cornea and the sclera. So remember, we're just seeing a cut cross section here. It actually goes all the way around the cornea, not as I'm just gesturing. It does not go through this portion of the cornea. It goes around the cornea. And it's probably best for me to draw another a picture from a different angle. So if you look at the eye from the front, of course, what you see is something like this. So if we look at the eye, and of course we're not doing any sort of fancy cross-section here, we're just looking at someone's eye, then what you generally see, and let's have them with blue eyes here, here's the iris, like so, here's the pupil in the centre. Okay, so you might see something like this, and of course this bit is the white of the eye, the sclera that you can see, and the cornea is covering this bit that the 
where the iris is present. And of course, the whole thing will then be covered by the conjunctiva, which I haven't put on here. Well, the cornea isn't covered by the conjunctiva, but up until the cornea, the sclera that's on display here will be covered by the conjunctiva. But I'm not going to put that on because that's just confusing matters. Okay, the point is that the cornea goes all the way around here, it covers the entire iris. So at this junction between the cornea and the sclera, surrounding sclera, that's where the canal of Schlem is going to go around in a great big loop, and we're just seeing uh, the cut sections of that, basically. So, to put a little arrow in then, the journey of the aqueous humour is to be produced by the ciliary epithelium, move through the pupil from the posterior chamber to the anterior chamber, and then be resorbed in the canal of Schnem. And this is normally how uh, aqueous humour moves. Right, so there's the background anatomy and the background physiology of the aqueous humour. So, to get too high intraocular pressure, you have to, the normal way that this occurs is by getting too much aqueous humour. The vitreous humour, that doesn't have the same problem of being continually produced like the aqueous humour and resorbed. Remember, it's a much thicker blob, basically, of jelly. It's not being produced and resorbed continuously in the same way that the aqueous humour is. So, normally the cause of raised intraocular pressure is having too much aqueous humour, and if you get too much aqueous humour, the pressure will go up in the anterior and posterior chambers, and that pressure will transmit to the vitreous chamber as well, so that the pressure inside the entire eyeball is too high. So, that's the basics of glaucoma. Now to discuss the two very different types of glaucoma. So, let's put this here. There are two very different types of glaucoma that develop in very different ways and cause very different things, very different presentations. Okay, so the one... Well, actually, no, I'll go over the one that we're not interested in at the moment because it doesn't lead to a headache. The one that doesn't lead to a headache is called primary open-angle glaucoma. So primary open-angle glaucoma. And because these names are so long, we often abbreviate them down. So primary open angle glaucoma is often abbreviated down to P-O-A-G for short. Okay, so what happens in primary open angle glaucoma? Well, primary open angle glaucoma is something that generally elder people get. And generally when they get it, it affects both eyes at the same time. And it is a very, very slow, and this is the key difference between them. Uh, this one is extremely slow in onset. It occurs over months to years. And what's going to gradually happen in that time is that the intraocular pressure is going to go up and up and up. And they're going to develop, therefore, intraocular hypertension glaucoma. Okay, so what is the mechanism underlying this? Well, in people with primary open angle glaucoma, there is a problem with the resorption of the aqueous humour into the canal of Schlem, but we're not totally sure of what that problem is. It seems to be that it doesn't get into the canal of Schlem properly. However, to contrast it between the other form of glaucoma that we're about to go over, the acute angle closure glaucoma, it's not caused by this angle between the iris and the cornea getting too small. So this is a key concept. This angle that we have here between the iris and the cornea, this is obviously the space that the uh, aqueous humour has to get between. That we call the angle. So we'll refer to that as the angle. So when people call this first type of glaucoma primary open angle glaucoma, that means that the angle is still wide open. So the reason that the aqueous humour is not being resorbed properly is not that this angle is closed, basically. It's that there's some problem with it actually getting into the canal of Schlem. It can get through this angle perfectly, but then actually getting into the canal of Schlem, there's some problem there, and we don't really understand exactly what that problem is, but it seems to be something that happens in older age. So, to summarise what then happens in primary open angle glaucoma, it's something that affects people as they get older generally. It doesn't usually affect younger people. And something happens that stops the uh, aqueous humour being resorbed properly into the canal of Schlem, but it's not that the angle has closed. The angle is still wide open, it's just not getting into the canal of Schlem 
properly. And this means that gradually over years and years and years, the aqueous humor is going to build up and up and up, and intraocular pressure is therefore going to go up and up and up, uh, and therefore you gradually develop glaucoma. But because the onset is so gradual, with intraocular pressure going up so gradually, this doesn't actually lead to pain at any point. The nociceptors in the eye don't register the gradual uh, rise in intraocular pressure. They get used to the intraocular pressure rising and because it's so gradual it therefore you know the nociceptors get used to it as it occurs and therefore even once you've got to very high intraocular pressures it doesn't actually activate the nociceptors of the eye and remember we've discussed the sensory innervation of the eye remember those branches that come off the nasociliary nerve of the ophthalmic nerve one of them uh, was the long ciliary nerve uh, the other were those branches that went into the ciliary ganglia and then um, came off in the short ciliary nerves off the ciliary ganglia and those penetrated through the sclera, remember, and moved in the space between the sclera and the choroid and those were the, those were the sensory innervation to the eye and some of those would have been primary nociceptive afferents. So this gradual rise in intraocular pressure, it doesn't cause ever the activation of those nociceptors. They gradually just get used to the higher pressures and therefore even once you've got to really high intraocular pressures, it still doesn't activate the nociceptors of the eye and therefore you don't get a headache. So I'll just put this here. So no headache. I'll also put the fact that this is usually occurring on both eyes. The pathology of there being some problem with resorption of aqueous humour that isn't to do with angle closure is usually occurring in both eyes at the same time, so it's often bilateral. So now, uh, this is a big problem. It is a big problem. Even though it doesn't give rise to a headache, it does cause big problems because it gradually damages the retina. You see, if you have too high intraocular pressure, it can damage the retina and the axons that are running into the optic nerve. So remember the organization of the retina, it's backwards. The photoreceptive cells, the rod cells and the cone cells, they're right at the bottom of the retina. The things right on the surface of the retina facing into the vitreous chamber here, those are the axons of the ganglion cells that are going into the optic nerves, and these are going to be the first things that are damaged. Now, which axons will be running right at the top of the retina? It will be the ones from these peripheral most portions of the retina, and let me explain that. If you think about all of these axons coming from the retina into the optic nerve, the ones from the peripheral most places, they're going to be running on the top, and the ones from the more central places, they're going to be running underneath those. So if I just draw a picture to explain this, I think a picture paints a thousand words sometimes. So I'm just drawing this bit out a little bit bigger now. So this is the retina drawn out a little bit bigger here. Okay, and from this peripheral bit, here will come an axon of a ganglion cell here, and this will then run over the ganglion cell axon from a more central portion here. So what I'm trying to tell you is that the topmost portion of the retina is made up of the axons of ganglion cells from the peripheral portions of the retina. Okay, and these are going to be the ones that are damaged first. So the raised intraocular pressure is going to damage these axons, and you're therefore going to lose sight from the portions of retina that the axons are actually being damaged from. And that means you're going to lose sight from the peripheral portions of the retina, and those serve the peripheral portions of the visual field. So gradually what happens in primary open angle glaucoma, unless it's treated, is you gradually lose your sight in the peripheral portions of the visual field, and your visual field becomes more and more restricted. So just drawing a little picture of this, um, you might start off with a visual field that's normal, so a nice wide visual field, but it might go down to you just being able to see in this sort of portion, and then it might get even smaller, so you gradually lose the peripheral portions of your visual field. So lose peripheral um, visual field, and this will be occurring in both eyes if it's bilateral. So lose peripheral visual field, and the problem with this disease 
is that it's silent. It doesn't produce any pain usually, and therefore people just lose their visual fields gradually, and they might not realise that this is happening, and therefore they might not go and see their doctor and until it's you know hugely damaged, and they're now realising that they've lost huge portions of their visual field, and by that point, there's been permanent damage to the neurons, and they're not going to recover even if we reduce intraocular pressure. Yes, if we reduce intraocular pressure, we can stop further damage, further loss of vision, but we can't give you back the vision that you've already lost. Uh, so it's a disease to be aware of and look out for. Okay, so that's primary open angle glaucoma, and the word that I would highlight to you again is it's slow, very, very slow, whereas the one that we're interested in, it's completely the opposite, so I'll choose a totally different colour. We'll go for, well, no, that's not a totally different colour, we'll go for bright red here. So the one that we're now going to discuss, the one that we're interested in because it gives rise to a secondary headache, is acute, and now it's the opposite, angle closure glaucoma. So you might be able to guess what's going to happen here. So acute angle closure and then glaucoma, which we know of course means intraocular hypertension effectively. And again we can abbreviate acute angle closure glaucoma down to AACG. Okay, so just to highlight the difference, this one's going to be extremely fast and it can occur in younger people as well as older people, whereas this one is a disease of older people. And this one's usually unilateral uh, rather than bilateral. It can be bilateral, but uh, whereas primary open angle glaucoma is usually always bilateral, this one can just be affecting one eye. So what happens then in acute angle closure glaucoma? So something happens that leads to the closure of this angle. And what that thing usually is, is that the iris here is ending up blocking that angle. So it's moved forward a little bit and it ends up blocking that angle. So the iris and the cornea come pressed up against one another and that blocks off the angle. And of course, once the angle's blocked, um, that's going to hugely reduce the resorption of aqueous humour. Therefore, the aqueous humour builds up ridiculously fast. So whereas in this one it's been over years, gradual build-up of intraocular pressure, this is extremely fast. Intraocular pressure, the amount of aqueous humour that you have goes through the roof. Intraocular pressure goes up extremely quickly. And of course, what happens when intraocular pressure goes up extremely quickly? That activates nociceptors inside the eyeball. Uh, the primary nociceptive afferents fire. They will go in in the trigeminal nerve, specifically the ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve, and synapse on second order neurons in the trigeminocervical complex. And again, they've come in through the ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve, so they'll be synapsing onto the same second order neurons as other primary nociceptive afferents from the ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve. Remember the convergence. So we've got meningeal uh, primary nociceptive afferents, peripheral primary nociceptive afferents, and now eyeball primary nociceptive afferents, and they can be converging onto the same second-order neurons. So when we activate these nociceptors in the eyeball, it's going to be activating the second-order neurons of the ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve in the trigeminocervical complex, and therefore we're going to be experiencing pain in the ophthalmic region, um, which we know is the frontal region and the periorbital region. So uh, this is going to give rise to a headache, um, and that headache is going to be um, unilateral usually, because it's usually just one eye that's been affected, and it's going to be in the ophthalmic regions. So re I'll remind you again that the ophthalmic regions are the frontal region and the periorbital region. So if we got acute angle closure glaucoma in our right eye, the one that I've drawn here, we would get a unilateral uh, frontal periorbital headache on the right hand side. Now, if this is not treated, and usually it will be treated because it's a very, very horrible headache and therefore these people will present to, you know, doctors uh, and will get diagnosed and treated. But if it's not treated, it can then lead, of course, to uh, neurological damage to the retina as well and therefore problems with the visual fields, just as primary open angle glaucoma can. Uh, but because this one's more likely to actually be spotted uh, it, and treated, it therefore... Um, isn't uh, going to lead usually to the loss of visual fields like primary open angle glaucoma can.
Okay, so this is the type of headache then that you get in acute angle closure glaucoma. And please, again, I'll stress the difference between what's happening here and the difference between what's happening here. This is a chronic condition of old age. This is a very, very acute condition where something has gone very, very wrong and is leading to a very, very fast um, onset of symptoms of this headache uh, in the ophthalmic region on one side. Okay, right. So, uh, let's now finish the video by discussing the treatment for glaucoma. And because I've spent so much time discussing primary open angle glaucoma as well as acute angle closure glaucoma, I'll discuss the treatment for primary open angle glaucoma as well. So, treatments, just to give you a little bit of background. Oh, and actually I've forgotten something that I meant to mention about uh, glaucoma. So, uh, well, about primary open angle glaucoma. There is something that you can see classically on thunderscopic examination of someone's eye if that eye is suffering from primary open angle glaucoma, and this is called optic cupping. So, I'll put this here. So, with primary open angle glaucoma, where you've had the neurological damage to the retina, you can get something called optic cupping. Now, this refers to the expansion of something called the optic cup. So let me explain what I mean by this. So let me draw a picture of the back of the retina here in a bizarre colour that I've chosen. So let's say this is the right eye and we're looking at the retina using a thunderscope. Here is the optic disc. Now, normally the optic disc has a hole in the middle here. Uh, a bit that shows up lighter than the surrounding bits. So this bit is actually going to show up lighter than the surrounding bits, and this is where the central channel of the optic nerve is. So you are actually looking at the central channel of the optic nerve when you see this. And that bit on thunderscopic examination is known as the optic cup. So this is a perfectly normal phenomenon. When you look at the optic disc of anyone who's got perfectly healthy eyes uh, with a thunderscope, you see the surrounding optic disc, which is where the axons are actually running, and then you see the optic cup in the center, which is the canal, and of course you'll see the central retinal artery and the central retinal vein emerging and going down there. Now, when you get uh, the loss of peripheral visual fields because of primary open angle glaucoma, of course, you're going to lose axons. Axons are going to be dying, and it's the axons from the peripheral portions of the retina that die first. Uh, so you're going to be losing axons that are going through this surrounding portion of the optic disc, and therefore the central canal actually ends up getting bigger. So you end up getting an optic disc with a massive central canal, central optic cup, so like this. So you end up with a very big optic cup, and that finding is referred to as optic cupping. So be aware that if you have had uh, a loss of peripheral visual fields because of long-standing primary open angle glaucoma, you can actually see this with thunderscopic examination. You can see this phenomenon called optic cupping, which means that the optic cup is far too big. And the normal ratio of the optic cup, it's supposed to be a third of the size of the optic disc, which I hope I've kind of put there. It's supposed to be a third of the diameter of the entire optic disc, whereas this is obviously, you know, coming on to maybe two thirds of the diameter of the optic disc. So this is optic cupping. Okay, so now let's discuss treatment for glaucoma. So we'll start off with the treatment for primary open angle glaucoma. So we can divide the treatment for primary open angle glaucoma into two different categories, which is uh, the treatment that aims to reduce the production of aqueous humour and the treatment that actually aims to somehow increase the resorption of aqueous humour. So remember, in primary open angle glaucoma, the fault is fundamentally in resorption, but we can compensate for there being too little resorption by reducing the production of aqueous humour. So how can you reduce the production of aqueous humour? So I'll just put this. So one of the categories of treatment is to reduce, or one of the strategies, I should say, for um, treating primary open angle glaucoma is to reduce the production of aqueous humour. And we can do this using two different categories of drugs. We can either use carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, and remember we could also use carbonic anhydrase inhibitors to reduce the production of CSF, but these also end up reducing the production of aqueous humour by the ciliary epithelium. And remember the key example of a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor is acetazolamide. 
So remember, carbonic anhydrase is a very important enzyme for catalyzing the conversion of carbon dioxide and water into bicarbonate and a proton. This enzyme is very, very important in the ciliary epithelium's production of aqueous humor. We're not going to go through the mechanism of production of aqueous humor, but know that the carbonic anhydrase enzyme is very, very important. And I should just add that we're talking about carbonic anhydrase inhibitor drugs, of course. So the carbonic anhydrase enzyme, very, very important in the ciliary epithelium's function as long as, as it was in the function of the choroplexus as well. So if we block the activity of the carbonic anhydrase enzyme, we're going to reduce aqueous humor production. And indeed, that's what the carbonic anhydrase inhibitors such as acetazolamide will do. So that's one way we can reduce the production of aqueous humor. We can also reduce the production of aqueous humor by stopping the stimulation of the ciliary epithelium to produce aqueous humor. So when the ciliary epithelium is usually producing aqueous humor, it's usually being stimulated to do so by the activation of certain receptors on its surface, and that receptor is the beta-1 adrenergic receptor. So we can therefore give beta blocker drugs to reduce the production of aqueous humor. Oh, and by the way, I should say that these drugs that we give uh, for the treatment of glaucoma, they're often given by eye drops rather than orally. So you give them in a little drop that they can uh, put onto their eye and then it is absorbed across the conjunctiva, or absorbed across the cornea into the aqueous humor and then it can get to uh, the ciliary epithelium. So you don't generally give these drugs orally, you can give them as eye drops. They can be given orally and they will be effective orally, but it's more ideal to give them uh, by eye drop because then we're delivering the drug directly to where we want it to actually go and hopefully we'll then get less side effects as well. So uh, all of these drugs are given by eye drops so I should actually just write that down here so these are eye drops. If the eye drops aren't working then of course you can try giving them orally. Um, some of them anyway, some of them can't be given orally because they'd have too many side effects orally. Okay, so beta blockers then. So we generally give a collection of non-selective beta blockers, even though it's the beta-1 receptor that's actually important. So the beta-1 receptor is on the surface of the ciliary epithelium, and normally that receptor is being stimulated, and this is what's driving the ciliary epithelium to produce aqueous humor. So if we can block the stimulation of that receptor, then we can block uh, the stimulation of the production of aqueous humor. And indeed, there are a bunch of drugs that we can give in eye drop form uh, to do the, just this. So these are all non-selective, uh, so timolol is an example, cartilol is another example, and levobunolol is another example of an eye drop non-selective beta. Oh, wait a second, levobunolol um, is another example of a non-selective beta uh, antagonist that we give by eye drop. So all of these are non-selective, so they block both the uh, beta-1 receptor and the beta-2 receptor. They're competitive antagonists. They bind to the receptor but do not stimulate it and block the endogenous ligand for that receptor from being able to bind there. Okay, so uh, it's the beta-1 receptor blockade that's actually going to stop the stimulation of the ciliary epithelium, though. So timolol, cartilol, and levobunolol, and again, Again, I'll stress that we really want to be giving these by eye drops because beta blockers do have side effects if they're given orally um, because, of course, they're going to go to a whole lot more tissue if we give them orally. Okay, uh, so that's the strategy of reducing production. Another strategy, of course, is by increase the absorption. Let's try and reverse the actual pathology that we don't understand here, and I'm afraid I'm not really going to uh, be able to give you the mechanism by which these work, because of course we don't understand what's fundamentally wrong, but these drugs we do believe somehow increase the resorption into the canal of Schnem, uh, that is of course the big problem in primary open angle glaucoma. Okay, so let's just change colour because I'm getting fed up with the yellow. Uh, so the class of drugs that increases the resorption of aqueous humour into the canal of Schnem is a class of drugs that we call the prostaglandin F2-alpha analogues. So prostaglandin F2-alpha is a very important example of a prostaglandin. It's not an example of a prostaglandin that we have yet discussed in this video, but it is very physiologically important elsewhere in the body. It's not a big inflammatory prostaglandin, and that's something you have to realise. 
The prostaglandins, different examples of prostaglandins are used for different things in physiology. Prostaglandin E2 was a major one of inflammation. Prostaglandin I2 was another major one of inflammation. But prostaglandin F2 alpha is a big one in physiology. So it's a very, very important example for prostaglandin. Now, we have drugs that are analogues of prostaglandin F2-alpha. They do similar things to what prostaglandin F2-alpha does. And we can give these as eye drops into the eye, and somehow these increase the resorption into the canal of Schlem, we think. So let me give you the names of these. So, two of them I'm going to give you the names of. Latanoprost, so they always end in the suffix prost, and then travoprost, of course, because of prostaglandin. So travoprost and latanoprost, these are prostaglandin F2 alpha analogues. They're given as eye drops and somehow they seem to increase the resorption of aqueous humor into the canal of Schlem and therefore seem somehow to reverse the pathology that we don't understand that is occurring in primary open angle glaucoma. Okay, so that was all just a little bit of background for your background knowledge. Of course, we don't really care about primary open angle glaucoma because that's not relevant to our video. Um, it doesn't cause a headache. The one we care about is acute angle closure glaucoma. And as far as the treatment of acute angle closure glaucoma is concerned, the treatment strategy is different. Remember, the fundamental problem here is that we have blockade of the angle. We've got angle closure. We need to reopen that angle. How can we reopen that angle? So think about this. The iris is too close to the cornea and the, the angle has closed. How can we do this? Well, the way that we can do it is by making the sphincter pupillae muscle of the iris constrict. Remember, in the iris there are two different muscles, the sphincter pupillae and the dilator pupillae. They're both smooth muscle muscles, uh, and the sphincter pupillae consists of smooth muscle cells linked around in rings, uh, whereas the dilator pupillae is radially, um, radial lines going outwards. Now, if we make the sphincter pupillae muscles contract, then of course this is going to bring the iris muscle inwards like so. So if I just draw a little picture of what that's going to achieve, it might take the iris from looking like this to looking now like this. So this is very over exaggerated, but this is gets across the point. When the iris is dilated, or when the pupil's dilated, I should say, uh, the iris is like this. It's much, much thicker, and therefore it's much more likely to be blocking that angle. Whereas when the pupil is constricted, the iris is much thinner, and therefore it's much less likely to be blocking that angle. So we want to make the sphincter pupillae muscle contract. That's our strategy for dealing with acute angle closure glaucoma. And the way we can do this is by giving M3 muscarinic acetylcholine receptor agonists. So... On the surface of the smooth muscle cells of the sphincter pupillae muscle, but not the dilator pupillae muscle. So this is a smooth muscle cell of the sphincter pupillae muscle. On the surface of this cell is going to be an M3 muscarinic acetylcholine receptor. So that's an example of a G-protein coupled receptor. So I've drawn it with the classical seven transmembrane domains. So the smooth muscle cells of the sphincter pupillae, but not the dilator pupillae muscle, have an M3 receptor. And this is actually the receptor that the parasympathetic postganglionic fibers that innervate the sphincter pupillae muscle activate. Postganglionic parasympathetic fibers, remember, release acetylcholine, which is the endogenous ligand for the muscarinic acetylcholine receptor of the third type. Okay, so M3, remember this is what we call a muscarinic, and I'll write this full great big name out, it's an example of a muscarinic acetylcholine receptor, and specifically it's the muscarinic acetylcholine receptor type 3. Okay, so the endogenous ligand for muscarinic acetylcholine receptors is of course acetylcholine, and uh, this is one of the major receptors by which the parasympathetic nervous system acts. Postganglionic parasympathetic fibers release acetylcholine as their neurotransmitter. So postganglionic parasympathetic fibers, remember, innervate the sphincter pupillae muscle. 
Um, and when they release acetylcholine, it acts on the M3 muscles, sorry, the M3 receptors, and this causes the smooth muscle cells to contract, and therefore you get pupillary constriction. We can hijack this system here by using a drug that will directly activate the M3 receptors. And one of the common drugs that is used to treat angle, acute angle closure glaucoma is a drug called pilocarpine, uh, given in eye drop form. And this actually is an agonist of the M3 receptors, but it's more than just an agonist of M3 receptors. It's a full-on muscarinic acetylcholine receptor agonist. It activates all the different types of muscarinic acetylcholine receptor. And remember, there are five in total called M1 to M5. Okay, so let me just summarise what I've told you about the treatment of acute angle closure glaucoma, and then we'll bring the video to an end. So pilocarpine, this is a non-selective muscarinic acetylcholine receptor agonist. It binds to all of the muscarinic acetylcholine receptors and activates them. On the surface of the sphincter pupillae smooth muscle cells, you have the M3 muscarinic acetylcholine receptor, and this receptor is the one that's usually activated when postganglionic parasympathetic nervous system fibers want to activate the sphincter pupillae muscle that they innovate. They release the neurotransmitter acetylcholine, often abbreviated down to ACH for short, and this activates that receptor, causing constriction or, well, contraction of the sphincter pupillae muscle and therefore pupillary constriction. So pilocarpine will do this, cause pupillary constriction, and that will hopefully open back up the angle, and now uh, the very high pressure aqueous humor can then be resorbed properly into the canal of Schnem, and hopefully intraocular pressure will go down beautifully. You hopefully won't have any lasting neurological damage and the, uh, and the headache will go away. So that's the strategy for the treatment of acute angle closure glaucoma. So that completes up our discussion of acute angle closure glaucoma as the final cause that I want to go over of a secondary headache. Thank you very much for watching this video on headaches. I hope you have learned a huge amount of neurology um, and well done for getting through all 36 parts.